Bueno, buenas tardes, soy Patricio Quinos, Crea Cañada Seca. A lo largo de todo este tiempo de trabajo con el equipo que diseñó el Congreso, nos hicimos un montón de preguntas. Eh, una de ellas nos desvela, que es cómo, cómo será el futuro, quién no querría tener la bola de cristal. Hoy tal vez podamos acercarnos un poco para hablarnos de estrategias geopolíticas y tendencias mundiales. El filósofo francés Guy Sormand nos filmó, nos grabó ayer una presentación para que todos nosotros hoy podamos compartirlas. Así que los dejo con, con el video de Guy Sormand. Argentinians, rural entrepreneurs have been quite good at feeding the world since a year, a long time, but especially uh, since 20 or 25 years, uh, in spite of domestic conditions which have been sometimes difficult and usually unstable. But the, the question today, uh, the world is changing so rapidly, as we know, I mean, is the uh, Argentinian production model, is it sustainable in the long run? Uh, my answer is yes, but yes only if you are, are very uh, careful uh, to understand the challenges and the new trends in our current world. What I will do uh, today is try to identify some of these challenges and uh, I will mention eight of them. Uh, challenge or trend number one is that they, in spite of the uh, 2008 crisis, uh, the economic system, the global system, is still there. Uh, it has survived. We still have free market. We have free entrepreneurship. Uh, we have uh, exchanges all over the world. And they, uh, in spite of this crisis, in spite of uh, heated rhetorics and political discourse, this model has not been replaced. Um, we, you heard about protectionism, you heard about economic nationalism, but the truth is that nobody came with a better model. Uh, the model is not perfect, but if you look at economic history, it's the best model we ever had. Uh, what about the crisis? Well, I'm afraid that crises are built into the system. Uh, why? Because, um, you know, modernity is based on innovation. Sometimes innovation works, sometimes innovation fails. When innovation fails, you have a crisis. Therefore, I think uh, we have survived this crisis, but we'll be confronted to more crises. And uh, this cannot be avoided, and also this cannot be predicted. It's what we call in economics the process of destructive creation. The worst in a period of crisis is political overreaction. Uh, because there is a crisis, people say, well, this is the end of the world, the end of capitalism. So overreaction makes crises longer and deeper. Thank God, basically, all governments have been able to keep their cool, and the system as we know it uh, will go on for a long time. And once again, nobody came uh, with a better system for the future, and this system brought a lot of good uh, to mankind. Uh, challenge number two. Uh, as I said, we just lived through a crisis, we'll have more crises, but what is more important, I think, is to understand that the, what I call the golden 80s are behind us. Uh, starting in the 80s, you had huge countries like China and India, shifting from socialism and closed economy to free market and capitalism and entrepreneurship. And this has created a fantastic economic boom. Uh, it has uh, brought to the market uh, hundreds of millions of people joining the new middle class and adopting a Western way of life, uh, especially uh, in food. And Argentinian uh, producers have been very good at seizing this opportunity and selling uh, to this new middle class all over the world. But uh, I think the time of very high growth, you know, when China was rising by 10% or India, India by 7%, this is over. Uh, this very high growth rate uh, was something exceptional. It was explained, as I said before, because these countries got out of socialism and also because they had a lot of catching up to do. Uh, what we see now is a uh, 
slow uh, growth, and which I think is a long trend, because if you look at the economic history, the normal economic growth is, let's say, 2%, including uh, demography. And as population stabilize and we are to a normal growth rate again, this means that the long-term trend in economics will be around 1-2%. This has consequence for you. Uh, you have to adapt to this slow growth, and uh, you will make gain through productivity investment, not only by extending the market. So productivity uh, will be the key uh, in the coming years, and not only relying on an ever-expanding uh, market. Uh, challenge number three, uh, prices will go down, uh, which may seem a bit counterintuitive, but I will try to explain why prices will go down and change the parameters of agricultural production. Uh, I will mention three factors. First, energy prices will go down, because new energy resources are found everywhere these days, mostly shale gas, which bring down the prices of production for energy, industry, and everything. So this is a very important factor, and it will increase in the coming years, less costly energy. Uh, number two, uh, patents prices will go down, and patents protection will be shorter and shorter, because you have transparency, because you have, you have the web, because you have piracy. This means that the uh, big pharmaceutical industry, seed industry, chemical industry, if they want to survive on this market, more competitive market, I mean, they will have to offer shorter protection and lower prices. And third, uh, transport prices will go down because huge infrastructure are being built all over the world and new conditions of transportation. Therefore, production, energy, patents, all this will converge uh, to lower the cost of production with a consequence for you. The consequence is that you will have more competitors. Uh, to get into the market will be easier and cheaper. So is it, is it good or bad to have new competitors? Well, it's okay if you adapt to uh, these new opportunities. I mean, if you see the challenges of threat, uh, it's not good. If you see that of an opportunity, uh, it will enhance your competitiveness and productivity. Uh, challenge uh, number four, uh, brands, branding will be more and more necessary, uh, including in the commodity market, to do, you don't have these days a lot of brands. Why? Uh, because, you know, we are at the very beginning of the biotech revolution, uh, which means that what you produce today in Argentina, maybe in the future, will be produced everywhere, not depending on the soil, not depending on the climate, because of the progress in biotechnology. And also, you will see breakthrough in biotechnology in the way to produce meat. We already have meat uh, which is grown in, in, in lab, you know, lab cell grown meat. I don't know about the taste, but this is the reality of tomorrow. So you will be competing with new way of producing food, new countries which will be able to do what you do. So what can be your edge? Uh, your competitive edge will come for your brand. A brand uh, describes the quality, a brand describes the reliability of the service, and if you have a strong brand, you are a better competitor, and also you are in a better position to resist the ups and downs of prices in the market. I mean, the market will always dictate the price, but if you are a strong brand, um, you are less sensible, uh, less uh, uh, disrupted, by the changes in market prices. Uh, made in Argentina today is not a brand, but I think that it could become a brand, which requires long-term investment. I will be uh, more precise on that in a moment. Uh, before, I mention challenge uh, number five, uh, which is about food pattern. Uh, you in Argentina, you benefited hugely these recent years uh, by the shift from um, rural people to urban life and toward the Western way of life and the westernized uh, way of feeding yourself, of eating. Uh, this went very fast. It could go fast in another direction. Uh, if you look at the trends in the West, for example, you have more and more 
hostility vis-à-vis -vis meat, you know, for health reasons or because it's maybe the fad, but this can happen everywhere. I mean, you can have disruption in food pattern which happen very quickly. On top of that, you remember, because you were impacted by that, by some health care. Uh, we had the mad cow disease um, in, in Europe and in the United States. So what I say that it's very important to monitor very closely the food patterns. You have been able to do that in the future, but I think this food pattern will shift very rapidly, and you must be very careful vis-à-vis uh, -vis this uh, yeah, consumer uh, behavior. Uh, challenge uh, or trend number six, it's about globalization. As I said before, in spite of the crisis, globalization is going on. But also, globalization is under permanent threat. You have a lot of countries which are not open to agricultural trade. You know very well about the European Union. The U.S. market is not easily accessible, not to mention Japan. Uh, we have now a new negotiation between the United States and Europe to open a vast Atlantic free trade zone. This could an impact, uh, have an impact on agricultural market, make them a little bit more open, but not for you, because Argentina diplomatically is very isolated and it's not part of this uh, uh, diplomatic process, which I deeply regret. Uh, now you are confronted to uh, European protectionism. Let's focus on, on Europe. And I share your struggle. I think that European protectionism is not good for the Europeans and certainly not good for you. But what can you do? You can go on complaining or you can create brands by reaching directly to the consumers and uh, other countries, like Chile, did that for wine, for example, fruit and vegetables. And you don't have this kind of food industry which could go around European protectionism. But you better think about it, and uh, it would be more efficient and more rewarding than just protesting against European protectionism, which I fear is there for good and for a long time. And this applies, as I said, to Japan as well. Uh, challenge number seven. Uh, what is the next frontier? Uh, in the recent years, you have been able to conquer, if I may say so, mm, South Korea, China, and to see the opportunities of this huge country shifting uh, to a new way of life. But China is a bit unpredictable. So if you rely too much on China, you may discover that China suddenly decides to close its border, and already we see the growth rate in China declining. You have voices in China promoting some kind of food autarky like in the past. So beware China. Uh, South Korea is more stable, but of course a smaller country. But uh, if we look at the next frontier, I want to attract your attention on two huge markets. Uh, India and Africa. Why India? India is a bit chaotic, uh, but in the long run, I think it's a more sustainable. sustainable uh, in the long run, India is a sustainable and growing economy. It's diversified. You see the middle class, which is increasing by leaps and bounds. And I think that India, for you, uh, deserve a very close look. I think it's a very promising market for Argentina. And Africa, Africa doesn't come spontaneously to your mind, but as you may know, in Africa today, um, the new middle class, westernized middle class, um, numbers nearly 200 uh, million people, uh, which is very significant. And Africa is not yet in a position to feed itself. Africa needs you, uh, doesn't need support, it needs trade, and also it needs uh, uh, logistical support, it needs training, and I don't see why Argentina, beyond commodities, wouldn't be uh, in a position to sell not only hardware, but also software um, to African uh, countries. I very much believe that Africa could be your next uh, frontier. Uh, challenge number eight and final, it's a challenge and it's a hope. 
Um, it's about Argentina. Uh, I'm very optimistic about Argentina. I know that uh, when I say that, I'm a bit isolated. Uh, but uh, Argentina needs to get into uh, a more modern political life. And this is essential for its economic future. When I look at Argentina today, uh, on the uh, United Nations uh, Human Development Scale, you are number 45, which is a disaster. I mean, it's one of the worst positions within the Western civilization. And there is one reason for that. The reason is that there is, you have no rule of law in Argentina. Argentina is completely unpredictable. You depend on the leader. You don't depend on the law. So modernization means that you need to shift from a political life defined by the leader, whoever the leader is, to a political life defined by the rule of law. If you have stability in the rule of law, you entrepreneurs, you can shift from short-term to long-term investment. Uh, the rationality today, because of the absence of rule of law, is to look for short-term return on investment. But this prevents you to building uh, a food industry, to build a brand, uh, to have long-term strategy. So economics and politics are really interconnected. And I'm optimistic because the people in Argentina now, they understand that. They look around. They see that Argentina is in a weird and isolated position in the world. And I think the trend toward the rule of law will be very strong in the coming years. And this will completely transform the economic outlook and the uh, rationale of being an entrepreneur uh, in Argentina. Now, I know uh, Korea is not a political party. Korea is not involved in politics. But I think Korea has such an experience in rational thinking, long-term thinking, investing in human resources, that it could be part not of the political life, but it could be maybe more active as a think tank for Argentina, as kind of a lobby for Argentina to bring about the rule of law. If you do that, you act in your own interest as entrepreneurs, but you also act in your own interest as citizens. And after all, you are both.